Hi, everyone. Good evening uh, to one and all who have come here. We have 41 attendees so far. That's amazing. Um, so welcome to this uh, panel discussion between uh, Ray Naval of Techstars and Ravi Narayan of DHub. Um, we are glad to have you on board and we're glad to have uh, both these dignitaries on board as well to share their insights and their experience. Um, I hope we learn a lot from them. Uh, just to set the agenda, um, the first thing that we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll start with the introductions and then uh, I will be uh, moderating a panel discussion between Ray and Ravi. And once that is done, we'll open up the questions to the audience and you can type in your questions or uh, yeah, you can type in your questions and I will narrate it out to either of them or both of them, depending on who it is addressed to. And they will go ahead and give a shot at answering your questions, right? So sit back, enjoy, relax, and uh, fingers crossed that we learn a lot from these two uh, gentlemen, right? So. First up is Ray Naval. Ray Naval is uh, a globally inspired entrepreneur and an early stage investor. He spent his first decade uh, of his career as a business developer, helping establish uh, companies like DoubleClick, MSN, Yahoo as key players in the North American market. In 2008, uh, Ray left uh, the corporate world to start Jigsy, a startup focused on bringing low income and rural populations online in India and in Southeast Asia. After exiting Jixi in 2015, Ray has been advising, mentoring, and investing in founders all across the globe. And we also have Ravi Narayan. Uh, Ravi is the CEO of DHub, which leads India's innovation ecosystem that powers the next generation products and new business models. In his two decade long career, Ravi has been a product engineer, an entrepreneur, investor, mentor, and a leader. He has co-founded three companies that, has, that he has led from inception to successful acquisition. As a global director of Microsoft for Startups, Ravi established accelerators and co-sold programs across the world. He has uh, chaired the Thai Entrepreneurial Summit, NASCOM Product Conclave, and Pan, uh, double, uh, Pan IIT Conclave. Right. Thank you both of uh, thank you both uh, Ray and Ravi for being here and spending time with us. I'll hand it over to Ray. Ray, if you could just talk a little bit about Techstars and what you guys are up to. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, so thank you for for having me. Thank you, Ravi and Ravi, for having me <laughs> here uh, this evening. Um, you know, it's it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking to the T Hub community. Um, so I I run Techstars Bangalore, as as Ravi mentioned. Uh, and we're, you know, we, we've now run two classes uh, out of Bangalore, uh, largely building for emerging markets. Um, so we've invested in, I think, about 18 companies from India, uh, one from Nigeria and one from Sri Lanka. Um, this year has been obviously an unprecedented year. Um, I hope everyone is okay, safe, healthy. Um, and, you know, we, we're seeing obviously... Um, uh, a black swan of kinds this year and, and many new opportunities emerging, um, many an, an acceleration of trends, if you will. And uh, to support what, what is happening, you know, we, we, we usually look at, at companies that, you know, are, are pretty broadly focused and, and building for uh, emerging markets. In, in this case, what we've decided to do is actually uh, focus our efforts on on that sliver of companies which is actually pretty broad in india that are just amazing product and technology folks building for uh global markets and particularly north america um so you know so techstars uh, i'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second but um i'm i'm honored to be here thanks for the introduction Ravi. welcome uh do you want to do the techstars introduction now or should we wait for Ravi to finish Sure, absolutely. Why don't I do that? Right. I'll walk you through the deck. Right. <clears throat> Did everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So, um, 
So I'll tell you a little bit about Techstars. Um, you know, I'll go through the the, the network um, and then deep dive on the accelerator, what to expect uh, out of Techstars Bangalore, and um, you know, we'll, we'll keep it pretty broad um, in this in this uh, overview. But um, you know, I'm looking forward to taking your questions uh, later on in the uh, in the panel. Right. So. Yeah, uh, first off, you know, Techstars was founded in, in 2006. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, not not too many accelerators that have been around since that time. Um, you know, it, it's been, you know, I think we were one of the companies that, that coined the term accelerator uh, back then. Um, and, you know, we, we largely work with uh, three types of constituents, startups, uh, corporations, and communities. Um, you may you may have uh, have have recognized uh, Startup Weekend, uh, which is our grassroots um, you know community focused uh, you know organization where we we bring in uh, facilitators from the community to set up uh, weekend events, uh, 72 hour events that that really give entrepreneurs the tools uh, to build companies. Um, we 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 focus obviously on on startups, uh, which is what what I what I really focus on through the accelerators, and giving them the ability to do more faster um, through our our programs and and also investing in them. And of course, we work with corporations, um, you know, who are usually the 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 buy side of the products and services that many of our startups build. Um, so just you know, being really engaged with corporations to understand their needs and how to better serve uh, those needs uh, within our startups. This is, this is kind of how we, how we um, break, break down our, our stakeholders. So as I mentioned, we, we, have, we have the various uh, community programs we run, like Startup Week, Startup Weekend, Startup Digest. Um, you know, we, if, if, if for any of you there uh, today, like you can access our Entrepreneur's Toolkit, which is a publicly uh, available um web kit which which breaks down it really pretty robust it breaks things down into 18 topics and gives you a lot of great content on how to build a business um and of course uh, well i'll tell you about the accelerator in a sec and um you know and and yeah the you know the idea is to work with companies uh across the journey from inspiration uh to ipo by the numbers in terms of you know what, what what's happened over the years uh, we've run 220 programs uh, like the one that I run, uh, where we've, um, you know, we typically invest in, in 10 companies per program. So that's well over, you know, 22, probably up, upwards of 2,300 companies right now. Um, those companies have gone on to raise 9.7 billion in total funding and are valued at about a $27 billion market cap uh, collectively. Uh, making us uh, the number one investor by volume in uh, in the world, according to Crunchbase. Um, and so, so this year alone, we will have uh, invested in about 470 companies so far. Um, you know, I think that number 2195 is an old number, so I think we're we're higher than that. We have a collectively uh, about 54, more than 54, probably closer to 6,000 founders now in our network, and that's a that's a you know that's one of the most engaged um, groups of of of, of people um, you know you can ever um, connect with, and and that's one of the big values of being a part of TechStars. We've had uh, over 231 companies uh, acquired, and in fact, this is a key number: 86% um, of those you know 23 or so hundred companies that we've uh, you know had the opportunity to invest and work with. Um, are still active or have been acquired. And if any of you understand, uh, you know, obviously how hard it is to build a company um, and, and, and the, the odds of success, you'll know that it's actually, it's about, you know, I think it's about 90% of companies fail within the first couple of years. So we're, we're quite proud of that. We work with um, a number of partners around the world, um, you know, to, to help, uh, you know, bring a lot of our startups uh, to the market, and you know, they, they, these guys, these these partners help uh, by providing uh, various kinds of benefits. In addition to mentorship, they provide sometimes access to services 
Um, so, you know, everyone from AWS, Peloton, Barclays, uh, US Air Force, Target, and we're so that power of the network, you know, there are a thousand plus investors that that are all part of Techstars and, you know, or that, that really kind of look heavily at Techstars. And our, our investors, you know, come from around the world. Um, one of the key, um, you know, one of the key differences with Techstars versus some of our competitors is, you know, we see, we see the opportunity to build great um, lasting and, and very large businesses around the world, uh, not just in the U.S. or not just in the Valley, and you know, and so we bring around investors from from around the world to um, you know who who really look at companies coming out of TechStars as a great signal uh, driver um, for investment. We've run about 1,500 plus uh, community programs to date. I know a lot of those are in uh, the India region. Uh, we have over 100 corporate innovation partners. Who are all plugged in and and you know very much um, looking to engage with startups that we uh, that we invest in, and you know we have over ten thousand mentors who are all part of TechStars and very much a part of our accelerator program. So let me tell you a little bit about the accelerator program. We uh, we invest in as I mentioned ten companies per program. Uh, you know it's a three month program. Which means that you know you it, it's pretty intense because during that three months you're not just consuming a lot of information and speaking to a lot of people, getting a lot of connections, but you're also running your business, right? So that makes it pretty intense. Um, and collectively, you know, this is the acceleration is is taking approximately two years of work and fitting it into 13 weeks. Um, that that makes it pretty intense. The the structure of those three months is. Month one uh, really focused on mentor engagement, so you could end up meeting, uh, you know, with with about somewhere between 80 to 100 mentors, uh, and that's each of you, um, each of your companies, and uh, you know, those are 20 minute type sessions where they ask you a lot of questions and they help you uncover different hypotheses and basically get you out of your head and 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 you to kind of speaking about your business, which is actually for entrepreneurs sometimes at the earlier stage it's pretty tough to get out of your head. Um, number two in the second month is, is really focused on, on taking all of the, the learnings and insights and new hypothesis that came out of, out of the first month and really growing with that and executing and building strategy that's sounder because it's got, it's been socialized with, with people who can, can, you know, who, who can share their wisdom with you. And month three, um, is really getting, getting your narrative ready and prepping for fundraising and demo day. And you know that's 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 typically the arc of of all of our programs. Typical week at TechStars, um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of office hours, so we bring in our mentors and experts to come in and, and meet with our companies. There's one to ones with me, obviously. Um, every week we I meet with the companies. Uh, we have all hands. Uh, you know, we we get the, the strong relationships are actually built between the companies themselves in the batch and keeping each other accountable is obviously a big part of the experience. Um, founder stories, we brought in some great founders in the past, um, you know, who, who come in and, and, and shared, you know, their whole journey. And, you know, and usually the, the founder stories we go out and, and with founders we go and bring in are usually pretty relevant to the uh, company that we're, we have in the batch. There's pitch practice when we get closer to demo day, and that's pretty intense process where you'll end up practicing your pitch about three or 400 times uh, to get it ready. It's, it's pretty intense. Um, and obviously there's there's a lot of work to do because you're still running your business uh, every day. Um, and of course there's workshops and things like that. But, you know, largely speaking, this is, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're driving this because it's, it's you that's benefiting from it. Mentorship is obviously one of the biggest takeaways. Uh, from the experience um, that I'd say, you know, having run a few programs now is what really makes a textbook experience um, what it is. And, um, you know, if for this particular program coming up, if you're building for a North American market, I'm looking forward to having some amazing mentors on, on both sides. Um, and then, you know, in terms of what we look for in a startup, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding along here. Slow me down if, if, if need to, Ravi. But, um, you know, in terms of what we look for in a startup, you know, you've heard this before. If you if you've spent any time, uh, you know, listening to to VCs and how they look at things, but 
but I can't emphasize enough how much it's about the team, right? So everything to me is about when I when I'm meeting with a, a team of an early startup, it's why are you guys the ones to be solving this hard problem? And 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 that that says a couple of things. One is I, I want obviously the team to have some background or empathy for what they're trying to do or the customers are trying to serve or the pain that, that someone has. Um, you know, I think that's really critical. Um, it's great if that team has some dynamic together. It's great if that team has more than one person. Um, you know, so so th there's a lot in the team. Uh, I think a lot of the times it, it's the, what makes a successful company. Um, you know, obviously having a great market is uh, is, is critical. Um, but you know, I think I think it, it could be a, a great market. It doesn't have to be the one you go after directly. Uh, you could go after a, a market you can win in that's adjacent to a bigger market. But I do we do spend time looking at market size a lot, and you know, we want to see traction. Um, and the idea you'll notice is at the last because the idea we know at the earlier stages is, is going to change. That's why what's what's really important are the other things. Um, you know, in, in just quickly, how we structure our, our, our investment. Uh, you know, there's a basically two parts to our deal. Um, there's a six percent uh, common stock that we 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 get as a fee for joining the accelerator. Would give you 20k as part of that, uh, which was originally inspired by needing to pay for travel or things like that that are not so much an issue when you're running a virtual program, um, which we expect this to be, by the way. Um, and then the second part is a convertible note, uh, which which you will have the choice to take. It will be granted to everyone who comes into uh, the TechStars Accelerator. And that note comes at a $3 million uh, dollar, US dollar cap and converts uh, at your next uh, equity financing round. And of course, you know we're, we're known for our legendary equity back guarantee, which says that if you don't uh, get value out of the program, um, you know, you will give you your equity back. And that's something that we, we do to really stand behind the quality of our program. And then, of course, uh, we have a ton of uh, perks that, you know, some, some will be very relevant to you depending on, on where you're focused and what your business does. But, um, you know, in the form of cloud credits or legal advice or uh, assistance with, uh, with banking, um, you know, all of these things come from our, our partners that are mentioned here. And lastly, you know, Techstars is for life. Um, the demo day is only the beginning. I'm always plugged into all of the companies that I invest in. Um, I still connect with the companies that came into my program two years ago. Um, we, we run business development and investor days for our companies to, uh, to participate in. It's up to you if you want to do that. Uh, we run, you know, I don't know how, I think we're, we run now virtually this year, but uh, you know, obviously we'd love to get that back, uh, you know, to a face-to-face -face experience as soon as we can. But you know, the world being the way it is, uh, I'm not sure when that's going to be. Um, and then, of course, there are we run uh, various uh, community programs, um, more focused on bringing together our companies through TechStars chapters in certain regions and TechStars Connect. Is TechStars Connect is actually a platform, kind of like a LinkedIn. That you use to um, to keep connected with each other and to get advice or whatever you need from other entrepreneurs who are part of the TechStars network. So last last uh, here, I promise, application process um, is really you know it's it, it's it's something like this. This is how you find out about us. Um, I welcome you to reach out to me. Um, you know to set up an office hour if you think that uh, this is relevant to you. Um, we're, we're appli our applications for the next program are currently open. It, they close October 11. Um, and, you know, the sooner we can get connected, uh, the better. And we end up uh, going through a selection committee process in early November, where we ultimately whittle down all of our, all of our applicants to 10, ultimately 10 companies that we'll make offers to um, sometime around mid to late November. Right. Thank you, Ray, for that passionate introduction. It was really interesting to uh, hear about Techstars all over again. Uh, Ravi, do you want to talk about T-Hub and uh, its programs? 
I will just ask sure. Jan to make you the presenter. Okay, cool. You can see my presentation? Yes. Great. All right. So, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, great. That was a great introduction uh, to Techstars. I've been watching Techstars. We've been uh, seeing your good work across the world. Uh, so we wanted to invite you to work with us uh, on this webinar just because we feel that all entrepreneurs across the world are, you know, facing a, a you know, an existential crisis. They're looking at themselves and saying, is this real? You know, am I going to get through this? And so to really help them get a larger perspective and also to know that there are several other entrepreneurs out there uh, that are going through the same process themselves. And also there are lots of entrepreneurs that are um, uh, ready to help uh, in this process. So I just wanted to give everyone a, an opportunity to um, uh, understand what T-Hub is. So let me just see if I can do this. Yeah, so um, T-Hub is a you know, very unique organization in the sense that we are promoted by the uh, state of Telangana. And uh, we, our, it's our responsibility to work with all the different stakeholders that you see here, the startups, the corporates, uh, investors, academia, and government. And the reason we do all of that is primarily to help the startups who are our focus, our core, um, to to bring the demand side. So like as Ray was saying, the corporates and the government for us are the major buy side for the startups. So how do we really create that excitement, create that uh, environment where startups can really uh, chance upon those new ideas, you know, validate their ideas and then build those revenues so that they can build out their products and services, uh, not just for this uh, part of the world, but maybe for the entire uh, global market. So uh, generating demand is as much an important thing as you know working with the startups and helping them grow faster. Um, investors, of course, are an integral part of the uh, ecosystem to help them be a part of the journey along with T-Hub is, is a big uh, element of the work we do. And then we also work with the academia primarily because we feel that there's a lot of wonderful ideas that emerge out of the academia and to really uh, help the startups tap into them, uh, encapsulate them into their products and services and take them to the markets faster than most other corporates would do. Uh, is an integral part of that and also a lot of you know students who are un unencumbered by what's already existing today what is the status quo would actually be able to conceive new business models new products new services uh, for the markets so um, we have a three-pronged strategy uh, we have uh, you know a whole family of incubation programs that are working with startups not at the very, very early stage, but startups that have reached a certain level of maturity, they do have some customers, they do have some traction, but they are at the point where they're really trying to figure out how to make some bets. Uh, so obviously the, the kind of uh, uh, priorities we have are no different from what Techstars talks about, but at the same time, we feel that we would like these uh, uh, family of programs to help those startups get to a point where they start hitting, you know, the uh, the product market fit and begin to interest the uh, VCs and others to, you know, get uh, get further along. So that's where the acceleration programs kick in. We feel that there is still a very a good reason for us to stay engaged in that part of the journey as well. And then finally, scaling, where we feel that we have even more. Uh, deeper uh, programs that we can offer you so that we can continue to be involved, continue to support you and, and build out your uh, startups to, you know, much, 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 much larger scale than you would have been able to do had you just done an incubation program or actual program and kind of went away. Um, the demand side for us is a huge uh, maybe a disproportionate amount of resources go into creating the demand. So we attract the, some of the 
the largest of the Indian corporates to come set up shops in uh, in Hyderabad. We you know want MNCs from across the world uh, to also set up uh, you know their offices there. In a way, look at Hyderabad as a place where they actually can you know find innovation, find uh, very interesting startups to work with. So that's where we uh, bring them in, and they are you know, about four hundred. There are about four hundred and thirty-five corporate partners of ours who are looking to work with startups at this moment. So you can imagine the kind of demand that we generate uh, for the startups to really come in and you know build out their startups from from uh, this city and this state. And then finally, being that we are a public-private partnership, we owe it not just to ourselves to do what we do at T Hub, but also to the ecosystem to help them uh, build out their capabilities much more, their capacity in a much larger way. So we do a lot of ecosystem uh, building programs as well. One of the things that I would like to uh, bring your attention to, and which is the topic of today, is the international programs. So we look upon ourselves as the gateway to the world, where a lot of startups are aspiring to uh, enter the global markets. So we have programs with uh, various um, you know, partners across the US and Europe, uh, and, and vice versa. There are lots of other countries that are looking to bring their startups into India because India is one of the largest and fast growing economy. And how do you really enter India? And India's market is not that simple. So, you know, helping them, you know, have a soft landing here as well is something that we help a lot of uh, startups across the world. So, I just wanted to uh, speak about one particular. A program which, for which we have uh, applications open now. So it gives you a sense of how we really work with it and have you uh, get uh, to be a part of this program. We called, this, called it Lab32. Um, I guess the pin code of uh, in Gachiboli where we are located is 32. So I think that's how we came up with this name. But uh, what we found is that, you know, we need to continue to evolve our own programs to stay relevant to our startups. So it's not the same program that you would have, uh, you know, uh, come into, you know, uh, late last year or early this year. It's a very, very different program. And the reason we are making this uh, different is the, the startups needs are evolving. The startups need are much more intense than it was before. And they also are looking uh, to uh, get a lot of these kinds of interventions digitally or through online uh, mechanisms. So we are uh, trying to make that happen. So it's a four month long program. We are um, starting out in the beginning of October and then going on till, through February. Um, so, uh, the, the, you know, the, we have designed two um, tracks. One is in the on the design side and the other one is on the marketing side, primarily to make sure that you you know go deep into one of them and get the kind of intense help and mentoring that you uh, can uh, do so in each one of these things separately and then um, also uh, through the process of doing this uh, you you get uh, access to a whole bunch of resources and so on and so forth so the the uh, analogy that i would like to use for you is that we don't see this as something that we, you know, uh, sit behind the computer and, 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 and give you some gyan, right? You know, in the Indian parlance, just giving you some ideas, giving you some you know, high level uh, guidance and so on and so forth. We actually see ourselves as, you know, uh, Krishna did with uh, Arjuna in, in Mahabharata, right? We're driving the chariot for you, taking you to the right places and providing you the advice at the right time so that you get that relevance, uh, the high uh, level of relevancy so that you can really uh, take some very, very crucial decisions, make the right uh, choices and you know go up the trajectory very, very fast. So that's kind of the philosophy behind uh, Lab32. And, um, and then this is interesting because while this is a startup program primarily, we also use the entire uh, T-Hub organization to support everything that you would need in terms of the demand side, in terms of access to market, access to investors, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to uh, give you a, a sense about uh, where we are. 
and i would i would urge you to you know uh, look into this program much much more deeply both uh, ravi warrior and myself are happy to you know answer any questions should you have you know beyond uh, this time so with that i'll just uh, stop here and i'll turn it back to you uh, ravi Ravi, thank you. Ravi, you're on, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry, like I said. Okay, uh, thank you, Ravi and Ray, for the introduction. And uh, because we are running out of time, what we'll do is we'll quickly jump into the panel discussion. Uh, and then we have some questions already from the audience. I will ask you those questions at the end. Right, so the first question, Ray, to you is, um, Post the first waves of COVID-19 pandemic, um, what customer needs and market opportunities uh, are you seeing rising in the North American market? Oh wow, it's um, it's it's really a, a massive. Let me make it simpler for you, Ray. Sorry. Okay, so what? Let let me make it simpler for you. So uh, what what uh, customer needs or market opportunities do you see rising across the globe? Does that make it simpler? That well, look, it, sure. <laughs> um, I, I I think one of one of the things I I talk about a lot is the fact that I actually wrote a medium post on this. Um, but you know, physical location no longer matters. Um, that that's one of the biggest uh, things to happen in 2020. Um, and and that's that's pretty disruptive in a way because you know in effect uh, you know particularly for for b2b but but it affects it's across the board um you know i think businesses that could invest heavily in in face-to-face -face experiences uh were able to win right in many ways uh whether it be enterprise sales whether it be um you know selling something a high ticket item to a consumer um like a car um you know and, and i think that has really changed this year. And, and so now everything in the world, whether you're a business or you're a consumer, is largely being bought virtually. And, and that opens up a lot of opportunity because what that means is in effect, um, you know, you could be a startup in Hyderabad and, and, and selling to you know, companies in the US or Europe or Canada or wherever. And, and and technically that that's all very possible now there's uh you know any any preconceived notion of wanting to meet face to face which would have been there in the past is gone so so that's that's the that's the positive the the negative side of that is that you know people the reason that they want to buy things face to face is because they want to feel safe they want to trust their decisions. They want to. They don't want to lose their job, right? There's a there's a saying used to be. Uh, if anyone is old enough to know this, is you know you, you no one ever got fired for buying Big Blue, right? That was IBM, and IBM used to sell really expensive mainframes. And if you were a person who was on the other side working at a bank, and you bought an IBM mainframe, you probably weren't going to lose your job. Right, because it was a pretty safe bet that an IBM mainframe was one of the best you could buy. So, at, in these times where there is no ability to get to feel safe through face-to-face -face interactions, you know, signals, signals are what really matter. Signals that create safety and familiarity and trust, and and that's what the the challenge will be. So, uh, you know, we're really so you know the the, the problems. You know, in many ways, the problems are are still the same. It's, as technology companies, a lot of us are enjoying an acceleration in trends. You know, for for example, distributed work was not a, a as common as it's become. Um, you know, sending uh, sending kids to you know micropod schools is not as common as it is right now. Um, so there's a lot of things that had started. It's not that there's new things. Zoom is not new. 
but all of a sudden we're seeing a massive ampli amplification and acceleration of, of their importance. And, and so, you know, I think learning to deliver signals through these new platforms that matter and new modes of communication that matter is really what's critical to actually overcome the challenges of 2020. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ravi, so based on what uh, Ray said, right, what do you think are the immediate challenges that a new business or a startup in India faces today? And specifically with regards to building a global product. See, um, as I was saying in the introduction, um, the startups uh, usually take a very incremental approach. Um, while you would think that, okay, let me figure out how to survive the next few months and then I will try to you know, go global and stuff like that. It's also an opportunity to see the world in a very different way because the way we left the world back in February, March, is not going to be the same world that we'll enter into, uh, you know, once the pandemic is past us. I think it's going to be a very different world. Those startups that are perceptive, those startups that are able to gauge the opportunities that are opening up and be able to grab them with both arms uh, are the ones who are going to really, you know, do very well. And uh, just because of the fact that now, you know, as we mentioned, uh, people are looking at buying which uh, you know online they were having these zoom conversations that will help them figure out uh, you know how to make so those decisions how to engage with their uh, you know vendors with the startups and so on and so forth so there's no reason for you to restrict yourself to uh, you know this part of the world india and then slowly you know uh, create uh, your plans for the global aspirations it's important to look at this as an opportunity to reset your expectations reset your plans and really launch yourself in a much larger way and that's where organizations such as you know techstars and phub come into picture because as much as we um, uh, are you know in the midst of all these changes that are happening we also bring that very objective view to take out those emotional connects that you may have had to previous you know, plans, previous products, previous uh, you know, uh, models that you had in mind. You know, maybe I urge you to get back to the drawing board and it, it is not something that should scare the hell out of you, but something that uh, you know that you're in safe hands while you're you know, making, that, uh, you know, uh, making that analysis uh, happen. And it's a matter of you know, a few days and then you come back out much stronger, much more uh, you know, passionate about what you have built, and uh, you know, have the conviction to go convince investors if you need to to make that plan work out for you. Right, um, Ray. Continuing with uh, what Ravi mentioned, uh, he also touched upon certain priorities that an Indian business would need to look at or you know consider uh, while trying to go 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 global uh, in the next one to four quarters, right? Uh, so what would you say uh, would be some of the priorities that uh, an Indian business uh, or a startup should be making or changing? So I think the, the first one is, is really understanding your customer and, and understanding your customer, you know, so, so if you're, say, example, a, a B2B company, right? and you're you're working with you know indian customers at the moment and you're planning to go and work you're planning to go and sell your service to the us market now you don't understand your customers you understand your indian customers but you don't understand your us customer and and i think that's a common mistake is this this kind of uh, misconception that you know um if I sell to a, a Indian division of a U.S. company, that I, I can equally sell to the U.S. division of the uh, U.S. the head office of that company, right? I think you really need to understand um, not just the landscape at a very detailed, high-resolution level. You know, you need to understand. You need to build a strategy, uh, which is a, a bottoms-up plan of how you're going to build out in the market, right? 
um, what what is it what is what is a what does year one look like, right? And and being being able to kind of know what what's the first step? Who are you going to really sell to, and how are you going to sell? Because it's the next part, right? How are you going to engage with the market? Right. The things that that folks don't do is is really understanding not just um, who's in the market, but how do people buy, right? How do your customers buy? So what I like to do is put myself in the shoes of my competitors and, and really analyze, you know, what, what is the language that they use, right? How do they sell? How do they price things? You know, one of the common things that Indian companies do is they actually underprice themselves when they are building for global markets, right? Um, so, you know, understanding the language, understanding the digital touch points, looking at your competition and figuring out how they sell. Finding your edge is critical. And, you know, in many ways, just because you can, just because the industry exists in other countries, right, doesn't mean that your competitive edge that you have in India is going to be the same one that you have in America. And I think really understanding that is going to be critical. And then, you know, figuring out how to um, leverage, you know, how to build familiarity, as I mentioned earlier, right? And familiarity, usually when you're new into a market, is going to happen through association, right? So from this program that we're about to run, I want to give familiarity to people because in the U.S. and in Canada, the Techstars brand is pretty well known, right? So that's one way of getting familiarity, getting a customer testimonial, right? Getting, getting that first customer and, and, and really using them, getting testimonials, you know, really turning them into a case study, showcasing that experience, you know, using a partner, right? Figuring out how to, what, what could be a great channel partner, or create an association of some kind that's also going to create familiarity because it's a brand or a channel that people know and trust, right? So that's, those are really critical steps, I think, to getting prepared to sell to uh, international markets. Right. Simple yet brilliant uh, insights, uh, Ray. Okay, so, uh, Ravi, you, you did allude to why they should, uh, you know, consider going, going, go, going global. Sorry, I always get tongue twisted there. Going global. Um, but, do you want to highlight two or three really uh, important points as to, you know, if somebody is not considering going global because they think, you know, we have 1.4 billion uh, people in India and you know, that's a big enough market for me and I can, you know, retire easily with whatever I sell to these people. Uh, what would you say to them? I mean, what would be, let's say, the top two or three reasons why they should really seriously think about going global, going global? Sorry. Yeah. Um, see, when I when I used to work for Microsoft, I was building Microsoft for startups. You know, I, I found a very interesting uh, uh, dichotomy. So, where the in the folks in Israel, for example, they were very very clear that they were going to build for a market outside of Israel, and it was usually the U.S. the American markets. And, uh, you know, having built the product, uh, the next step within a few months was to move to New York or California, and that would have their journeys uh, take off. On the other hand, when I was uh, helping startups in China, it was very clear for them that they were not going to go global at all, and they will only do stuff in the, in the Chinese markets. And they would find a way to make that work because there were restrictions and, you know, there were other support systems that would keep them inside. And, uh, you know, while those were very clear uh, choices for these two markets and uh, the startups in these two markets, India, unfortunately, doesn't give you that very clear choice. For, perhaps, you know, for the first few years uh, when the startups were building out, uh, you know, and they had this very uh, ideological thought process of, you know, selling to India, you know, being an Indian startup and all that. They very quickly realized that the Indian customers were not very excited about buying from startups. You know, there was that big, big blue, not buying from big blue, uh, you know, 
uh, sentiment that was already there. And also, uh, they, they were very uncomfortable with this entity called a startup. And uh, I think they did a lot of that continuing, but not as much as before. But also, you have begun to see that a lot of uh, customers in India, um, and, uh, especially the banks, which I'm very, very surprised by, that you know these probably are the most conservative org of organizations in a, in a country. They, they are the ones who moved very fast and embraced fintech startups and you know, started working with them. So you're beginning to see that the Indian market is indeed becoming more open and more uh, interested uh, in, in, in buying. And, you know, and, when, and Microsoft, when I was trying to get um, the subsidiary uh, to uh, get startups in front of our uh, you know, corporate customers, uh, India was the first uh, subsidiary that was actually taking the chance with startups and putting them in front of their customers, which, which I thought was a huge signal for a, a large company to say, I will do it, but I'll do it first in India. And, uh, and then this became a model for us across the world. So the co-sell program that you alluded to in the introduction was a program basically saying the Microsoft, uh, you know, uh, salespeople will uh, take the uh, products of the startups and offer it to their customers, obviously as a part of a larger bundle, but nevertheless, you know, it's an access to market, right? So, so I think uh, you you're beginning to see that there are uh, you know certain channels that are forming. Uh, so, if you do have something compelling, there are large corporate partners that are willing to take you global. There are lots of uh, other channels that are also becoming available in taking you uh, to the global markets. And if you have all these as opportunities, there's no reason for you to restrict yourself uh, to say I'll do it for the Indian market or I will you know, uh, do it first for the Indian market and do for the global markets. I think you just need to take a, a look at what is it that you're pro providing in terms of value and therefore, what is it that you can charge in terms of a price for that product? And if you feel that the price is compelling enough uh, in the Indian markets and the Indian buyers would buy, so great, go for it and make that happen as one of your, you know markets or one of the areas that you will sell into one of the territories you will sell into but if you feel that there is a much larger market and the price that the markets afford for your products are much higher in other markets then i think you should definitely look at how quickly you can enter those markets with the right kind of partners with the right kind of funding in making that happen i think uh, you know startups lives are very um, uh, and the windows of opportunities for the startups are limited. And so what's the best way you can actually, you know, take full advantage of those windows of opportunities is the way I, I would urge startups to look at and definitely for the Indian startups. Because I think they come up with brilliant products and there's no, re no need, reason for them uh, to restrict themselves for the Indi to the Indian market just because they happen to be, you know, building it out of here. Right. Thank you, uh, Ravi. Um, Ray, this I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get you to expand on something that you mentioned earlier, uh, right? Uh, so my question to you is this: from your experience, uh, personal experience of working with tech star startups, uh, right? What is it that do you, you know that you tell them to either do, fix, or change? One of the things that you mentioned is uh, you know prioritize. Um, understanding your customer and getting to know them and you know how to sell to them but other than that what else do you tell them to either do fix or change if they want to gear up for the global market well uh, i mean a, a big one uh for us right now um are digital touch points so if you think about it in absence of having a store or a salesperson um who's going to who's going to be coming out and and speaking uh with your customer um you know for many of us the start of the experience happens with content happens with a landing page uh, happens you know with some type of digital uh touch point right and i i can't emphasize enough um how different the brand language uh the design language you know the business language is uh between 
between markets, between countries, and, and, and particularly between India and Western markets, right? So, you know, I, and, I, and I see this a lot in my work because I, I, I work with companies in India, obviously a lot. I work with companies um, in North America a lot. And, you know, I, I, see, I see websites where the, you know, the, the words are very, for example, um, Indian websites will make use of, hyper, Indian uh, companies will make use of hyperbole, right? Which is a, kind of an exaggeration, right? Um, and that's very common and you're almost at a loss if you don't hyperbolize your product, right? Uh, this is the best in India. Well, you, you, you can't necessarily just say that. I mean, you can in the US, but if someone has any reason to doubt that, that's going to create mistrust. So you want to be able to source that in some way. Um, you know the the language is very different the 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 way that that things are made up I, I would actually encourage you to read a post that i just put, I put a lot of time writing about this particular topic but I'm getting shared oh thank you that those those assets those digital assets you have are really your represent that's your representation to the market that's your face to the market and so you want to make you want to create some semblance of familiarity and that's why i come back to this point of really examining your competitors and and that's that's going to be your your way of of seeing how like what kind of emotions do they appeal to in their in their in their actual digital um materials right um what what kind of de design language that they use a lot of the times those things are there and 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 they're there for very specific reasons so pay attention to those very subtle cues and make sure that you're getting them incorporated in what you're doing. And, 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 you know, we're all tempted to, you know, especially as Indian companies, we know that getting a lot, like we're going to go hire contractors. It's obviously very tempting to hire Indian contractors because, you know, we're there, they're cheaper. We trust them. They're familiar to us, but oftentimes those, those contractors who are creating the websites or the materials, they also don't understand the language of the market you're about to go and enter. So, so, so to get that right, I can't emphasize and you know how important that is. Right. Okay. Uh, I just need to add something to that. This is from my experience. I know I'm not the panelist here, but um, so for Lab Thirty Two, my team and I, we've been going through I don't know a lot of websites, uh, you know, of the applicants. And one thing that I consistently see in about 60 70 percent of the websites is the website is made for an investor right so you have about us and big profile logos and what we are going to do and our technology and this website talks nothing about how a customer benefits from using their product right and, and it just it surprises me that they're not making a website for the customer. They're making a website for, uh, there's, there was one applicant that actually made a website for uh, T-Hub, right? We're, welcome T-Hub and, you know, please consider and stuff like that. Um, and one thing I keep telling these guys, don't make a website for us. Don't make a website for investors, right? You already have a PPT. You already have a slide deck for them. Your website is for your customers. They need to understand you better and they need to understand why they should be using your product. I mean, the investor is going to invest in you anyway if he likes you and your, you know, like you mentioned, the market and the potential and the idea. He doesn't need to see all this stuff on the website, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's more impressed at your ability <laughs> to your customer than they will you speaking to the investor. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. So one last question before we end uh, our panel discussion. Okay. So. Again, this is kind of a summary of everything that we've spoken about, right? Um, if you had to say, uh, from your experience, um, you know, over the last few years, what is that one big pitfall that you've seen new companies, you know, startups fall into consistently over a period of time, uh, you know, fall into while trying to take their business global? You know, you mentioned uh, the design, you mentioned uh, 
uh, the, you know, the, the the language and stuff like that. And, you know, and Ravi mentioned, um, you know, how they're not taking uh, or taking that risk or the courage or don't have the courage to, you know, try and sell to somebody else. But other than that, I mean, people who are trying to actually go global, right? Uh, people who have the risk and you know who have the courage and taking the risk. People who have uh, modified their web pages and their products uh, for a different market. Despite that, when they try to go go, go global, uh, I should try and figure out a different phrase for that. Go global. Um, what is that one thing that you know just tanks them completely? So, Ravi, do you want to start? What's that one thing that you know just kills that initiative of going global? <laughs> yeah. Um... So I think uh, you know entering any new market is 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 not a very easy thing to do. As much as you have traction in a certain market, you have good customer stories, you have case studies, you have uh, some level of uh, price points that have been figured out, promotion that's been figured out, all that stuff. But it it, it always takes a lot more time uh, to figure out new markets. And who better than a founder? to you know figure out the new markets and you know create the right uh, understanding of this market because i feel that the founders have the best understanding of what is it that their products can do and cannot do and what is it that they can do to change those products if necessary the look and feel of the product or the feature sets of the products whatever they have the best understanding why versus what the customers are looking for because as soon as you try to push it down to somebody else or try to say that a channel partner should do this or a or a, an, an employee that you can afford and you put on the ground there and say you have to make this happen suddenly <clears throat> the the understanding of the the opportunities or the signals that are coming from the customers are lost and they are not taken into in its entirety in in its in its its true sense and uh, you know, so imagine if you put a sales guy there. I mean, he's a great sales guy. He's done this kind of work in the past, but for a large company, and he knows how to run the sales machinery. So he needs a machinery to run. But you're not giving him a machinery. You're saying you figure it out the market and then build the machinery after that. And you know, he or she cannot do that. It's usually a founder who, you know, uh, does a lot of iterative processes and then ultimately arrives at what really works and also at the same time uh, a lot of times you you feel that uh, you know bringing somebody of a of a certain kind and you know creating that level of credibility through the through the money that you're spending is is the only way to do it i think most customers are swayed by the passion of the of the founders they're swayed by the the insight they bring, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the discussions than anybody else. And also, of course, uh, you know, there are several founders I can uh, uh, speak to you about who have made some decisions on, you know, uh, creating a, a very different sales strategy for the for the market based on what they heard, right? So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, en entering new markets cannot be, you know, uh, relegated to anybody else in your organization. It's not a delegation uh, game you as founders have to put in that six to nine months of work to understand this for yourself before you now formulate you know the go-to-market strategy for that market and then you know uh, start uh, you know processizing this and then getting some other people to take these things on uh, that's one thing and also post the fact that you have now put somebody there on the ground you have the ability to understand how the sales process is working because you have done this a few times yourself uh, because a lot of times as you can imagine a salesperson will tell you oh things are going extremely well they've already now looked at the proposal they've asked us a few questions and you think it's at night like you know 90 percent and it's just going to close in two months but you don't have a, a feel for it if you you won't be able to gauge the real progress unless you've done this yourself and then you can know exactly whether this is a lot of optimism or you know somebody's blowing some smoke uh, you know up your backside right so so for for a founder to be involved in you know entering new markets is absolutely absolutely essential 
Okay. Thank you. Ray, what's your one very frequently seen pitfall that startups fall into? Well, I, I first of all, I, I agree and in, in wholeheartedly with everything Ravi said. Um, I think he gave you a very detailed explanation of that. I'll, I'll say two things, more than one. I'll give you two. One is, um, you know, don't make any assumptions, right? Uh, you know, you you protect, go in with a beginner's mind. You assume you know nothing, and go out and and build from the bottom up uh, a view of your customer in that new market. So I think that's critical. And second is there's no shortcuts, right? And which I think is what Ravi was really saying is, you know, you 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 know be very so look at it as as you know a lot a lot of Indian founders specifically that I've worked with are very quick to embrace um, you know third party uh, you know commission sales uh, folks and consultants to go out and and sell their products and you know you're losing out that valuable IP that intellectual property of understanding your customers, understanding this market. And all you are is another widget in that person's briefcase. You know, they don't really, you know, value you. They don't feel the connection, the passion for what you're doing, as Ravi said. You know, that comes from you. You need to be the one who's able to articulate what you're doing in a way that they can they can understand, um, that your customer can understand. And you need to be developing those relationships. Relationships are one of the most important IP that you can have, right? And so don't give that away. You know, be, be, be very clear that that's the value. And for an investor that's coming in and evaluating your business, they're going to evaluate your business on the strength of your relationships with your customer. So don't give that away. Um, so those, those are the two things. I, I think Ravi really covered it pretty well. Right. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take a five minute break. Um, we have a short survey slash feedback form, uh, which uh, I would like the audience to fill. So uh, just give me a second. Giant, if you're on the call, can you just paste that link, please? Right. So there's a link in the chat box. Um, if all of you could just you know click on it, it'll hardly take 30 seconds for you to fill that up. Uh, we'll take five minutes though as a break. Uh, you guys want to go and get a, you know, a glass of water or take a restroom break? Feel free to do it now. We'll come back in five minutes. Right. Uh, just one thing before we uh, leave. Okay. If you don't get enough feedback, then I'm not going to be asking any questions. Right. So make sure that you go and fill those feedbacks. Right. Thank you. Uh, okay, Kiran, uh, the chat box, okay, the chat box should be, I don't know, uh, the last box, last drop down, it says chat. Okay, um, let me see if I can copy this. Sorry. Uh, Right, I just pasted it again, so hopefully you should be able to see it in the answer, no, sorry, in questions section. Okay, Android apps.
Uh, Ray and Ravi, some of them have asked for your email addresses or LinkedIn profiles. Um, uh, basically, they have questions about uh, the textiles program and T Hub. Uh, T Hub, uh, I will. So, for the T Hub programs, uh, Lab 32 program, I'm pasting the email address for you to connect and ask us questions on. Um, for Techstars, um, Ray, is there anybody specific that they can connect to to ask about the Techstars uh, program? So they can, they can uh, so we have a program manager, her name is Shipra Vinay, and so she would be um, the ideal person to connect with for um, kind of, you know, broad general information about the, about the program. Of course, uh, if anyone is interested in, in, in meeting me and having an office hours with me, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, Shipra is usually my, my, um, my conduit. Uh, so, you know, I'd say, I'd say reach out to her, uh, shipra.vene at techstars.com. I think we can, um, we can post her email address and, um, right. I'm, I'm just doing that. Uh, Shipra. Sorry, just give me a second and I will post the email address one second. Okay. Right, done. So you have both the email addresses for both uh, the programs. Uh, feel free to connect with Shifra or my team that's at lab32 at dhub.co. Right, so we have a few responses for the feedback. Uh, I think we can continue. Uh, that wasn't an utter failure, so I'm happy about that. Okay, so the first question is, uh, it's not specified to whom it is, so I'll leave it open to either of you to answer. It's from Sailaja, uh, and she asks, please share your thoughts on how to take forward locally built health tech products to sub-Saharan Africa, where it's needed the most, and how do you do it you know, through NGOs? So. Any tips for Sailaja? How do you connect to NGOs to, you know, uh, to take your healthcare product to Sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah, I mean, I, for personally speaking, I, I don't have a ton of experience in that in that area, so I, I wouldn't be the best person to comment on that. Um, but okay. I do know there are, you know, quite a few nonprofit organizations and foundations that um, operate in Africa and and probably provide uh, a great mechanism for you to learn about the market and and the, the need over there and figure out because I think I think there's it's a pretty complex um, area as I understand it um, but yeah I, I think there's there's probably groups that you can approach to get a better sense of that of that opportunity right Ravi you seem to always have answers and insights. For those who don't know who are attending uh, this, uh, this uh, panel discussion, so uh, Ravi Narayan is the guy we go to when we are stuck with things. So uh, he usually has all the answers uh, for all our problems. So it's good to know. But may have stumped me this time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyways, um, uh, I'm, I'm a partner in an organization called. Uh, Social Venture Partners, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, which has got a lot of, uh, um, you know, different partners across the globe. Uh, so maybe if you can just uh, uh, send me an email with what you're doing and, you know, what you're looking for specifically, I will uh, uh, try to put you in touch with uh, the network and then uh, they will try and find you the right connect for that. Okay, I'll, I'll, put, right. I'll put my email to the chat box. Cool. Uh, okay. Next question is by. Uh, okay, this doesn't scroll down. Uh, can you please tell us more about? 
Okay, this is a generic question. It's got nothing to do with uh, either of the programs or to go global, but uh, Kushbu has a question. Can you please tell me more about emerging markets, uh, which you are currently focusing on, uh, like healthcare or fintech, and do electric vehicles come under these emerging markets? So I'm assuming she is talking about the programs, so she is asking with relation to programs. So Ray, do you want to talk sure. about uh, Dexters? So basically she's asking, uh, would you consider an EV uh, startup as an emerging startup, emerging market? And you know, would they have a chance in the program? So yeah, I mean, when we, when we talk about emerging markets, I think we are, we're, we're really, we're talking about, you know, particularly, um, you know, developing countries, right? And, and, you know, when we talk about emerging markets, usually the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, um, you know, and, and so that, when we use that particular term, that's what we were, we were really referring to. And of course, within there, EVs are absolutely, um, you know, a, 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 a you know, one of the, one of the areas we would look at um, within within emerging markets. So, so the answer is yeah. It, it, for all of our other programs, which were really driven around solving emerging markets problems, um, you know, EVs would have been a, a total, you know, easy easy no brainer for us. Um, for this program, where we're focused on on helping companies that are building for the North American market. Um, you know, also EVs are certainly something we'd be, we'd be entertaining. It's just that we're going to look for, you know, what's going to be the edge of whatever your innovation is or whatever your product is in the North American market. Right. Uh, Ravi? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll interpret this question a little differently. Um, emerging markets is not what I would look at as a geography. And I was saying more so even now because of the pandemic and lots of things having changed. So there are certain uh, markets that are definitely throwing up, you know, plenty of opportunities uh, already. Uh, health tech is one, uh, fintech is another one, uh, logistics, you know, blockchain, uh, more so cybersecurity uh, at this point in time. And, and, and things like that, that definitely have shown that you have to, um, you know, modify the way you do business, modify the way you support your customers, modify you deliver uh, your goods and services and so on and so forth. So all of those things are definitely already changing, you know, uh, dramatically. So, you know, who better than startups to jump in with both their feet and use those opportunities to build out you know their products and and uh, and services, so that's one way I would look at that. The other thing, obviously, uh, as a uh, as a you know um, result of all these changes, uh, may not have emerged you know right away, but if there are uh, much more um, uh, deliberated way much more respectful ways of you know building out your products and services that don't necessarily have the same ecological uh, impact <clears throat> which you was <clears throat> thought about <clears throat> under clean tech under you know various uh, other energy tech and and so on and so forth those were great ideas uh, people were getting ready for certain um, imminent circumstances, you know, maybe 20, 30 years down the line. But some of those are going to be creeping up on us very, very fast, you know, given that we, are, we don't want to kind of hit the same set of circumstances once again. Uh, and so if, if you really look at uh, the world from that perspective, you know, a lot of the EV and such uh, opportunities are something that will take even more uh, you know, precedence in in the plans of you know, a lot of large corporates, also the governments across the world. So that will also happen. Uh, I would suspect uh, very very soon. Uh, so all of these things are uh, definitely something that you should continue to work on, and uh, you will find that there is a lot more uh, listening uh, to these kinds of ideas now 
and there is also the openness to acquire from startups uh, to really speed up their prior you know plans around this right thank you ravi uh, we just have two more questions um, so this again is is to both of you um, are non profit ventures considered in techstar and tia for the programs yeah so i'll, I'll take a stab at it um, so absolutely um, you know we we do work with non profit ventures uh, you know so I, I welcome you if, if this if that's something you're doing to apply. We also uh, run a social impact program, uh, which is designed specifically to help um, social impact companies and nonprofit uh, types of businesses. Um, so I would welcome you to apply to that one as well. Um, so you know there's there's quite a few things, but we're absolutely um, open to looking at a nonprofit even in TechStars Bangalore. Right. Uh, Ravi? Yeah. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we also are very open to the idea of working with uh, not for profit uh, you know, companies. As, or, or should I uh, interpret this as companies that are looking at social impact or other impacts primarily, but profit is not the primary motive of building this or you know, valuations, which most of the other startups that apply to our programs. So definitely we look at that. In, in fact, there was one company that came into our program last uh, in lab and batch three of lab 32 called Let's, Let's Endorse. Uh, they've done phenomenally well, you know, got a lot out of this. Uh, so definitely uh, we do uh, look at that. Also, the other hat that I wear uh, in Telangana is I'm the chief innovation officer. So creating grassroots innovation, wow. social innovation, uh, you know, school and 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 uh, you know, uh, college innovation is something that is something that I work with very closely. So in that aspect, uh, you know, creating those uh, right, uh, you know, uh, access to markets for those kinds of um, uh, startups is definitely something that we do a lot of. So given the combination of what we do uh, in in uh, T Hub uh, through. A, programs like Lab32 and access to channels and markets through the work we do in the uh, in the other uh, aspect of uh, the, um, uh, social innovation. I think they, there may be a way that we can you know, help you. So do uh, talk to us a little bit more about what you are planning to do and we can figure out the best next steps. Okay, uh, we have one last question. Again, it's a very generic question, uh, but since it's the last question, I thought we might as well answer it. The question is, uh, sorry. Okay, um, for US investors to invest, is it easier from a regulations and a compliance standpoint to register an Indian company uh, in India or in US? Yeah, it's definitely, um you know, uh, your domicile structure, meaning which 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 country you're you're incorporated in and where the parent company is, is is a really important decision to make. Um, and you want to you want to get proper advice to think through that one. Um, but certainly, you know, investors, you know, in in, in certain geographies are often um, are often limited. You know, in in you know they're you know, they, they have to actually invest a pretty large proportion of their funds in their home geography. So, so certainly where you're domiciled um, impacts the decision or impacts the, the, you know, the number of investors who will be able to invest in your company and where those investors are going to be from. Um, so if you are building for the U.S. market, you think a lot of your customers are in the North American market. Um, you know, and that's where most of the investor base who's investing in companies like yours is, then, you know, you probably want to consider domiciling in a geography that they are capable of investing in. So that's something to really research and understand um, before you make that decision. Right. Uh, so Sumit, Murthy and Kushbu have thanked you both for answering the questions. Kushbu has one more. Uh, Again, if I can just get my mouse to scroll. Okay, at what stage should a startup apply to Techstars or T Hub? 
So I'm assuming for textile uh, acceleration and for lab 32. Okay. Uh, from a textile's perspective, you know, we are, we're looking for companies that, in the context of this program, we're looking for companies that, you know, have validated um, their, their product in, in, in a foreign market, in the U.S. market, in the North America, could be Canada as well, right? Um, you know, the, it, it, I'm looking for companies that are kind of beyond that kind of notional view of, hey, you know, one day I might want to expand into the U.S. or I'd like to, you know, maybe consider it. Um, I'd like to have companies that are very clear that that's, that's the next kind of step, next phase of the business and they're building for that. And they've already started building for that. So usually, if you know, you've already got a pilot or a proof of concept, um, you've already got a first customer, um, you know, these things are important signals for us that you really take the market seriously. Um, and yeah, ultimately, um, you know, we're looking for companies that are really serious about that. And it could be that, you know, it could be that they've just raised, um, you know, a small early round and, and they're really, you know, they've been preparing themselves or it could be that they've over, they're already, you know, revenue uh, generating. Um, we're open to to all all stages. Right, Ravi. Yeah, um, as you saw in the introduction of T Hub, uh, we have multiple programs. Uh, Lab Thirty Two has its own requirements of when you can apply to that program, but there are multiple programs in the incubation, uh, you know, family of programs that you can apply to. You can find a lot of those details on the website a community program is something that is even preceding lab 32 that you can apply to so uh, we find a place for you to be part of the t hub uh, family of programs one way or the other so do check it out and, and apply and uh, as you begin to grow you know there are different programs that you you know begin to uh, look at uh, more deeply for raising funds maybe going global for various other aspects of the growth of your company and that then you would apply to those as as you know things become more clear for you so uh, i think you know you will find something or the other that is suitable given where you are in your entrepreneurial journey today right um, one last question i hope uh... Yep, last question. And this is to you, Ravi. Um, this is by Sumit Mahendra, and he is asking, legal tech is quite a new domain which is booming in the States. Uh, does T-Hub consider legal tech startups with high social impact on the bottom of the pyramid? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, Sumit, I'm assuming uh, you're asking whether T Hub's programs considers uh, legal tech startups in their programs, or are you? Uh, and I hope you're not asking whether we think legal tech is at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, right? So, if you want to clarify that, you have just a few more seconds to clarify that, and Ravi can probably, you know, uh, rephrase his answer or elaborate on his answer. Yes. Uh, okay whether legal tech domain is accepted yes okay so uh, the answer is yes sumit cool uh, thank you so much everyone we are we've run out of time i uh, i had an amazing time talking to the two of you and asking you i'm hoping some smart questions uh, uh, and i hope the audience really really took a lot from you uh, you know points to ponder and you know actions to take so that was the whole point of this thing that both of you from your insights from your experiences and insights give the audience something to take away to do or think about so i hope that's uh, that our collective objective has been met thank you to everyone who attended this and took our time to attend and listen to uh, me i don't know if you listen to ray or ravi but it doesn't matter i'm, I'm glad that you listened to me at least uh, so thank you uh, all of you I hope you all take care, stay safe, um, and you know all the best with your ventures and your ideas. Take care. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Great Bye -bye. question. Okay. Bye. Bye, Ravi. Bye, Ray. Thank you for everything. Thank you.
Bye, Ray. Bye.